I uh, just want to welcome everybody to our uh, weekly uh, Roadway Safety Institute seminar series. And uh, before I introduce our speaker and his topic, uh, I'm going to have Kylie Bivens first to take care of uh, some uh, regular stuff. Thanks, Max. Uh, today's seminar will be streaming, streaming live on um, via the YouTube Live. So for those of you that are in the audience in live here, please save all of your questions for the end, and I will pass around the microphone so that everybody live or streaming will be able to, to hear your questions as well. Um, for the remote audience, please sign in with your name as well as uh, your organization and all other people that are streaming with you. Uh, we do have to report uh, viewer numbers to USDOT, so we would like them to be as accurate as possible. So if you could please put that in your chat box and also use that chat box for any questions you may have during and throughout the seminar. Um, but with that, I will pass it off to Max. Thanks. I just want to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Dan Work uh, from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's got kind of an interesting background, besides having his uh, PhD uh, in civil engineering uh, from University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he spent uh, a number of years at the Nokia Research Labs uh, in the uh, Berkeley area, uh, worked uh, there on uh, smartphone apps for traffic estimation. This is back between 2007, 2010. In 2010, he actually also worked uh, for Microsoft Research in Redmond, Washington, uh, also working on traffic estimation. So he's been doing a lot of practical things besides the kinds of things that he's going to talk about today. Uh, the title of his talk is Traffic Monitoring and Safety Critical Environments. Uh, Dan is part of uh, a team of three faculty at the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign that are partners with the Roadway Safety Institute, and so uh, they're being funded by uh, some of our, uh, our good dollars that come from the U.S. Department of Transportation, and I'm sure he's going to talk a little bit more about that uh, during his talk. Uh, Dan uh, has also won the Career Award from the National Science Foundation in 2014, and his PhD won the uh, Best Dissertation Award from the IEEE ITS Society. So he comes to us with a lot of interesting background, and so without further ado, Dan. Thanks, Max. Oh, no, you yep. have any, uh... Yeah. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Again, my name is Dan Work. I'm going to be talking about traffic monitoring and safety critical environments. The high level theme I want to get across is that there are problems out there that Google Maps can't solve, that Apple Maps can't solve today. I'm going to try to hint at what some of those problems look like and, and what we're trying to do about them. Um, you know, the, the 30,000 foot overview of what my lab works on is motivated by, you know, you look at the critical issues in transportation, whether you care about the environment or safety or congestion, the fact that our infrastructure is getting old. Um, if you want better performance out of your systems, um, we're, we're likely to see huge performance increases by linking our physical infrastructure with our computational infrastructure, whether it's through simulations, through finite element analysis, uh, whether it's through integrating real-time sensor data. The computers are getting so much faster. Sensors are so much cheaper to deploy. It actually allows us as researchers to see more about how systems perform in the real world so that we can understand them and then we can improve them. So my entire research lab is sort of driven by this unification of computational tools and physical stuff so that we can extract performance out of our systems, make them safer, make them easier for people to, to use. And uh, you know, as Max mentioned, we're doing some work with the Roadway Safety Institute, work that I'm, I'm very excited about. And what we're trying to do is actually leverage the fact that if you care about uh, roadway safety, particularly at the points where you have at-grade crossings on your, on your road infrastructure with the rail, you have a real challenge here. One, because it's difficult to instrument all of those intersections throughout the country. And two, you, know, you, you see it in Minnesota directly, right? You have all this uh, oil traffic that, that wasn't, didn't even exist you know, 10 years ago that's happening on, on the network. And if there's a collision beyond having a, a loss of life, which should be your first priority, you also have huge environmental implications to having this, the, the, these types of accidents. And you see some work even just in the last you know, couple months the Federal Railroad Administration is trying to get information out about where these crossings are so that companies like Google and Apple 
can take advantage of those crossings in your, app, in your mobile application and say, well, maybe we can route you around some of these crossings that are unsignalized so that, if they're, you know, that you can be in a place where you're protected. Now, the only problem with that, Google hasn't actually figured out a way to integrate this data into their phone. And you can start to think about why, from, you know, even from a basic human factors perspective, just knowing that this crossing exists doesn't actually tell me very much. What I'd really like to know is, when is a train going to be at that crossing? Because most of the time, it's safe for me to cross it. There's only a, a very small period where I need to be concerned about possibly alerting drivers so that the drivers um, recognize that there might be an imminent collision. Using some type of dynamic rerouting, like that, what Google would do is pick a route that's different than that crossing because either there's a risk of a collision or because they can get you around because that train might be blocking that intersection for some period of time. And one of my collaborators at Illinois, Yen Feng Ouyang, is worried about, well, if I'm an emergency responder, having a blockage at that intersection might last for some period of time. So any information that we can provide about when those trains are going to be at those crossings might allow us to provide a variety of safety and operational improvements uh, on our road network. And so this project's been going on for about nine months now, but we're, we're both working with Amtrak data and with uh, data from a uh, class one railroad company. We take the real-time data, we take the historic information about the database, and we try to develop data analytics tools, estimation algorithms, that can help take this information. We know it has errors. We know that it doesn't perfectly reflect what will happen. But we try to build tools that give us good predictions about when we can find those trains at those crossings so that we can inform the commuters about those p potential collisions. So that's work in progress. We just, submitted a, uh, just presented a paper at the IEEE ITSC conference where even doing some relatively straightforward data analytics tools, we can reduce the, or reduce the error in predicting those arrivals at those crossings by more than 60%. So now we're trying to beef up the analytics and beef up the data to extract even better estimates on that side. But again, you can see relatively large improvements in our ability to predict when trains will show up just by doing you know, very stu simple stuff that you might learn in a machine learning class uh, you know, in the first semester of grad school. So the, the rest of today's talk, I really want to focus about trying to estimate traffic in conditions where safety matters. And what I, what I want to do is really focus on pre-planned events where you know in advance you're going to have something on the roadway or you're going to have a uh, difference in the traffic dynamics because people are trying to get into an area. Um, you might have uh, changes in the travel demand patterns because of an event, either getting people out of a city or back in. I'll talk some about incidents. You know, this is what we regularly see on the freeways every day. I think uh, even from some conversations here, there's certain intersections. I guess one of the most dangerous intersections in Minnesota is just down the street. So anything that you can do to respond to those incidents better would certainly be helpful. And, and better yet, any way that you can reduce the possibility of having those incidents would be sort of the, the ultimate goal. And then I want to conclude with some work that we've been doing recently on trying to figure out how cities perform under really extreme events like natural disasters. So again, these are the hard estimation problems. They're also safety critical because you have the network topology may change. You have bridges that flood or tunnels, or bridges that, uh, that, that collapse or tunnels that may be flooded. Um, you have the d travel demand patterns that change. You might have power outages. So all of this you know, traffic signal control that you've already designed works great as long as you have power supply. Right? Your sensor network might not have any power. So these, these types of things make it very hard for the Googles and the Apples of the world to take historical information that they've learned through several years of people driving on the roadways and apply them to these conditions that they have never seen before. It's hard to build a dynamical model that will tell you about an environment that you haven't seen if you're just looking at historical data to do those predictions. So that's the high level theme for what I want to cover today. And, and in more detail, I'm going to talk about an application we've been working on at Illinois to help the DOT better manage traffic during these events. Uh, I'll talk about some of the estimation algorithms we deploy uh, to help track what the traffic conditions are around some of these events, and, and in particular, one that was motivated by uh, trying to avoid high speed collisions on freeways. Um, I'm going to focus on some estimation work that we've been doing trying to unify two separate fields, one based on statistical tools for incident detection and others that use traffic flow theory to estimate traffic conditions. We'll show that if you do those two problems together, you can actually get better incident detection and traffic estimation uh, in one algorithm rather than separating them out into two. And the final piece, as I mentioned, I'll talk about some of the work that we've been doing experimentally in New York City by processing a lot of data that they already have from their taxis to understand how the city performs typically and during extreme events like snowstorms and uh, like hurricanes that hit the city. And we'll see some very practical findings out of that data that actually changes how cities might respond to some of these events. 
Okay, so the first part I want to talk about is the, is the planned events. Um, you know, why, why you should care about planned events? Well, there's, you know, uh, more than 20,000 of these planned events in the United States annually that have more than 10,000 visitors. Um, of course, there's, you know, generate a lot of congestion delays, but they also have economic benefit. So we're not going to get rid of these events purely to solve congestion problems. We need to be able to deal with those and deal with those in a way that won't basically make the traffic coming into those events have more accidents than you would experience in other conditions. And as I mentioned, you know, the Googles and the Apples of the world, they, they have real-time data everywhere. Not true. Okay. If, if, did it, how many people drove today? Okay, a handful. Um, and how many uh, people that drove to, to campus today used a navigation app for their commute? So we went from, I don't know, nominally eight people to zero. Well, the GPS on your phone is a very power-hungry uh, 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 sensor. Right? And so the companies like Google and Apple will not run your GPS in the background of your phone. They will use it when you are running navigation. So if you didn't navigate to work today, even though you may all have Google Maps or Apple Maps on your phone, you didn't actually send them any data about the traffic conditions today. So this lack of data on the surface streets makes it very challenging for them to estimate what the conditions look like when you have something very dynamic or unusual happening on the network. And moreover, if you're trying to do any type of traffic control, like if I want to reroute traffic coming into an event, I need to know the flows, what the actual counts look like. And speed measurements are very difficult to invert back into counts that might be actually coming into the roadway. So that's why you don't see these problems solved yet by, by these types of companies. So we, we had an idea that you know, in, uh, in some situations, it may actually make sense to pay people to go out and collect data directly for these events. And the application that we built is called Traffic Turk. How many people have, have seen one of these devices? This is a turning movement count board. You know the story. You carry these out to the intersection. You press the buttons as the cars go by. All right, they're several hundred dollars, but they give you nice information about what's happening at the intersection. You go plug it back into your computer, do the signal timing optimization, go change the settings in, your computer, or in the field, and you're happy. The name Traffic Turk is inspired by the Mechanical Turk. If you're not familiar with the Mechanical Turk, it was a chess playing machine. Underneath the chess board was actually a box where a human sat and pulled the lever. So you had something that looked like a machine that could go out and beat famous chess players, but it worked because people were behind the scenes actually putting all the intelligence in it. And in the same way, you know, the turning movement counters of the world are the transportation mechanical Turk. We go out there and collect sensor data that's easy for our computers to read, but it works because we physically go out there. So our idea was that, well, you know, these are very expensive, but if you could put these on a phone, then you might be able to, at least temporarily, go out and collect lots of information to feed these traffic estimation algorithms in these dynamic events. So the high-level idea is you get a picture of an intersection, and when a car drives through the intersection and goes from left to right, you swipe with your finger left to right. If it turns, you know, if it's coming from the, from the left side and turns up, then you swipe your finger to, to, to match. So again, this is going to encode the counts at the intersection just by swiping your fingers. And there's some work on the back side where, you know, you find your location, we use OpenStreetMap to identify all the street names so that you can load them up into the, into the phone and actually see the street signs. So here's an intersection, Main Street and McKinley in Decatur, Illinois, one of the places we did a deployment. And the app, you basically just drag the name of the street to the place where it's located on the intersection. And the reason we had to do this is because we found that even though the phone has a compass in it and can tell where it's facing, the people encoding the data couldn't figure out where they were facing. So by actually physically having people label the intersections and the street signs in the app, it made clear to us that we had a good mental mapping between what the users thought they were encoding in the roadway and what was actually on the road and the traffic that was going in there. And then we used the compass to tell if they got it correct. Okay? So it really forced the person to be involved so that they would avoid making mistakes in terms of how they were actually lined up at the intersection. Once you have this, you get the data stream and you can see the little flashes that indicate cars going through or turning right turning left at the intersection. Great, we solved the sensing problem. We have this data stream, but it doesn't really tell us much about the traffic conditions. What I'd really like to know when I don't see any flashing, is that because there's no cars there, or is that because the light is red? Uh, and this problem requires us to actually infer the traffic signal phase uh, to identify uh, what movements are allowed, but we're not, we're not seeing, and which movements are not allowed. Okay, so the high-level idea in terms of the modeling on this side, we model it as a hidden Markov model. The tool you just need to know is basically we'll have a phase, which is the state in the system that basically says, let the north-south traffic go, or a phase that says, let the east-west traffic go. And as soon as you see a, a count, maybe a left turn, 
from the eastbound side or a through movement from the eastbound side. These are emissions that occur with certain probability according to one traffic signal phase. Like if it's a north-south direction, you should have high probability of seeing through movements from the north-south direction. You should never see a left turn from an east direction because that would directly conflict with the north-south traffic. So when that happens, you have a probability of transitioning into a different phase that would allow east-west traffic where you'd see a much higher probability of seeing that left turn occur. That's the high-level idea on the modeling side. And what we can do then is take the data and it will actually, we see these things, the actual turns, left turn, through movement, whatever, and we try to estimate what phase is showing up on the traffic light. So here's an example of one of in the intersections where we applied this in Urbana-Champaign. The football stadium is just to the right. This is one of the areas that we do the deployments. And you have heavy traffic going in this direction, some heavy traffic coming in here. This is the type of data you get out. You can see southbound through, southbound right turn, southbound left turns as a function of time. And if you look at this data and tell me which of these phases are showing up on the traffic light at any given time, it's clear that it's hard for a human to do this. And in fact, in this short period of time, every single phase shows up out of these eight phases except for one. And I, I, by looking at the data, I couldn't tell you. But you run it inside one of these hidden Markov models that try to estimate the state from the data, and you can see that actually we can get very good recovery of the true phases. We had two grad students, one that wrote down what was actually happening at the light, the other one that's putting in all the data in the app to do the estimation. You can see we, make, we still make mistakes. No algorithm is perfect. This is actually a, a, a maneuver that was valid both in phase three and in phase one. And you see phase six, the traffic that comes out of the football stadium on a typical day, there's nothing down there in Urbana-Champaign. It's a very remote area. So that phase never gets triggered because there's no re reason to let all that flow through. Okay, so fine. So we've estimated the phases at the intersection. What is that good for? It doesn't improve you know, our knowledge of what's actually happening in any meaningful way, except when you tie it to the fact that in events, the traffic signals are often overridden by people. Chicago has a traffic management authority that actually puts people in the streets and directs traffic with their hands to try to keep the flow moving uh, to these events. And if I want to have any ability to predict what's going to be happening on the roadway, where the congestion is going to grow, where the queues are at, and the queues are really critical, right? Because if I have a queue, that's a place where I could have a high-speed collision that I want to let people know about. So I need to be able to predict when I send traffic down a certain direction and then this person starts to activate the traffic with their hands and let people m move forward. If I don't include them in my traffic model, there's no way to find out if they're going to let all the traffic through or, or hold it back. I have to have a model for what they do. And the, the way that we do this is actually by trying to estimate the logic that they use directly from the outcomes that we observe from them. So we only see basically the flow in which phases they're letting the traffic come through. And from that, I'm going to try to predict what logic they're using to do this. Okay, and in some areas, this is called behavioral cloning, inspired by the fact that you want to try to clone whatever they're doing. In other areas, it's called an inverse optimal control problem. Rather than trying to figure out the best thing they should do, you assume what they're doing is the best for some unknown performance measure. And the goal is then to estimate the performance measure. So how does this work in practice? You have a very uh, simple ordinary differential equation. QI is just how long is the Q on link I, approach I, if you will. And it's a function of how many cars are entering during the phase minus how many cars are departing during that phase. So these are the arrivals and departures. For this type of ordinary differential equation, you have to do some bookkeeping with slack variables to keep the model well posed. These details aren't so important because ultimately what you do is take this model that says the number of cars on the queue is how many cars come in minus how many go out. Um, we're going to discretize that and throw it inside an optimization problem. So the classic optim optimal control problem is find some objective function that may be a function of the queue lengths, it may be a function of how long the lights have been green or red, and I might try to do things like minimize delay, maximize throughput, these are sort of classical problems, and I need to subject those, that performance measure to the, to the constraints at the intersection, that there are queues evolving on the network, and that um, the queues need to be physical, they can't become negative. The queues can't go too long or they spill back into the intersection behind them. Um, the phase lengths, typically in traffic signal controllers, you won't let a light go green forever, so we have to inc include those as constraints in an optimization problem. And the hard work is basically specifying this objective function and trying to solve this type of optimization problem. And what we do, you know, what, what this work in, in uh, SIAM by Bart Deschuter did, he recognized that this problem is a very hard one to solve because you have this product of two terms here. It makes the problem non-convex and makes the optimization more challenging. He realized that for certain classes of objective functions, things that basically penalize long, long queue lengths, 
you actually don't need the hard constraint. You can solve this easier problem where, the, where this constraint is missing, and it's still optimal for the original problem. Okay, so, so that's nice because it makes it a nice convex program, but our problem is not to solve that prob problem. What we're trying to do is say, look, from, from the data we collected with Traffic Turf, I know how long the queue lengths are, and I know when the signal switched, again, from that hidden Markov model we just went through. So knowing what the controller at that intersection actually did, can you give me a some weights in a family of objective functions where these weights are going to tell me what that person is actually trying to optimize. So again, you have the optimal decision variables you observed, and what you're trying to find is what are the optimal weights that that person was maximizing. That will tell us what their control objective is, even if they can't tell us specifically what they did. It is optimal in the sense that if you simulate or resolve this optimization problem under those learned weights, it'll mimic the behavior that that person did as far as the throughput and the queue lengths go. Okay, this generates another optimization problem, but this other optimization problem you can prove is convex. Convex optimization problems are so-called the easy optimization problems to solve. So we take the data, we plug it in, we solve this new problem, and it tells us the objective function that that person is most likely optimizing, at least as far as solving that new optimization problem will generate flows and, and counts at the intersection that are consistent with what we observe. So we apply this again to intersections and you can see things like out of the, out of the hand designed features or performance measures that we think are possible, then we take the data, we throw it into the optimal control problem, the inverse optimal control problem, and it can identify the feature that you're optimizing. And then when you resolve it, you can see actually good agreement between what the uh, traffic signal control did and what we thought it should do based on these learned features that we think it's optimizing. Okay, so now that basically gives us an idea of what the flows are doing at the intersection and what the controllers are doing at the intersection. And then we can actually use this for practical deployment. So this is the Illinois football stadium. We worked with the local police department here to go out and put 100 and, uh, about 110 people on every major intersection in Urbana-Champaign. For three hours before our homecoming football game, we had more instrumentation on our traffic intersections than anywhere else probably in the country because there aren't that many intersections and we had most of them covered. Okay, and then we can feed that data back into our computers and then in real time give information to the police department about where the queues are and if there's an emergency vehicle, where they need to be going to avoid this traffic. Okay, and then we had a bunch of other people that were behind the scenes trying to help make sure in the data collection from an experiment, if somebody's phone runs out of battery, you know, somebody gets, gets them a new phone. So it's very highly engineered. We pay people to go out there and collect the data. But for the first time in the history of any football game in Urbana, the police department actually knows what the traffic conditions look like during their game. It's not anecdotal evidence from a bunch of people who thought they saw something happen at a given time. They can actually see the inefficiencies of one person controlling traffic at one intersection propagate to another one. Right? And, and again, the goal here is you know, we're trying to help them understand what's actually happening on their network not what they think is happening on the network. So they can actually do uh, better design. After we did that experiment, we got ca called by the county engineer for Decatur, Illinois, which is uh, even more remote than Urbana. They have an event, it's called the Farm Progress Show. You show off the latest tractor technologies, the latest tiling machines, things like this. And the problem is it brings about 100,000 farmers from all over the region to Decatur, Illinois. There uh, is a major freeway that runs through here. There are no inductive loop detectors anywhere on this network. The traffic signal controllers here have some sensors on them, but they never go outside of the traffic control box. And so you have huge traffic as people are trying to get to this site. Here's an overview, of, an aerial view of this site. And you see these huge queues building up on major highways and the freeway. This is, that's a, that's a two-lane freeway, speed limit 70 miles an hour. On most days at 6 o'clock in the morning, you will never see traffic. So if you're a trucker and you take this, you know, Every week you drive this route, you never see traffic there except for the one day the Farm Progress Show runs and you have a huge traffic jam. So the city, I mean, of course is very concerned about this, the county as well, because these, this queue, if there is a semi driving all night long and hits the back of this queue, it's going to kill somebody. And they've been trying every year to figure out different strategies to, to manage the traffic and get it off of the, get the queues off of this freeway. But since they don't actually know where people are coming from, they don't know if they should be doing a different reroute. And so what we did is deployed 31 different people out there during the morning rush and actually measured where all the people are coming from, reconstructed the flows, and then actually helped them evaluate the possibility of doing a reroute down here into the site. 
And what we showed that is if they added additional manual traffic controllers to those intersections during those peak periods, they could actually shift the queues from off of this freeway back onto lower speed roads where if there's a collision, it's going to be less likely to be a high speed collision that would lead to a fatality. So again, we see something very simple. Let's go put in temporary sensor networks and that will help us actually see what's going on so we can manage the traffic better and get rid of the possibility of these queues that create these very unsafe driving conditions. Okay. Based on that work, we started now working with the state of Illinois in terms of uh, a, a site where you cannot deploy people to count cars and manage traffic, and this is in the work zones. So we've got a project uh, helping the, the Illinois Department of Transportation figure out, now that they're paying for sensors in their work zones to try to give back of queue detection, try to give motor strategies in terms of rerouting, um, how do you design these systems in ways that are cost effective? Do you need one sensor every 200 meters? Do you need one sensor every kilometer? Do you need one good sensor, or can you get away with five bad sensors, five lower quality sensors that might be, you know, 10% as expensive? And right now they don't have good ways to test this because every time you go out and deploy a sensor network in the field, it's very expensive. Want to try to, you know, put more sensors in there? Well, you have to go buy more and plug them in at the same time. So what we're doing is basically taking some of the sensors that they've already got deployed uh, in some of these work zones in, in Illinois, and then we model them in AIMSUN, it's a m traffic microsimulator. And in AIMSUN, we can very easily simulate things like what would happen if you had better sensors or better algorithms. How much would that actually improve back of queue detection? This is an ongoing project. We're about a year in. But already we've seen that some of the sensors that are out there today are, you know, if they're, uninstalled, if they're not installed properly or they're not managed properly, um, you can have huge errors in the speeds, huge errors in the counts, even in areas where if a stretch of roadway, if I count, there's no entrances and no exits, these counts should be identical, subject to sensor noise. We're finding that one of the sensors counts at least twice as many cars as another sensor does. So there has to be an explanation for that, and right now we don't have the answers yet. So we're ultimately trying to help the state figure out better traffic sensor network deployment strategies, better work zone technology deployment strategies, so that if they're trying to improve safety in these areas, they're actually putting down the right sensors for the applications they're trying to drive. Okay, so that's some of the work that we've been doing on the planned events. I want to switch gears now and talk about uh, a different problem we've worked on, which is trying to understand the traffic conditions around incidents. And the high-level idea here, of course, I mean, the reason you should care is that incidents generate fatalities. They generate huge amounts of non-recurring congestion. And our, our single takeaway idea here is that, while there's been a lot of work on incident detection that doesn't necessarily directly use information about the traffic state in, in the neighboring environment. And similarly, there's a lot of work on traffic estimation that doesn't use any information about the incidents. Maybe if we could feed the traffic estimation algorithm with the incidents and the incident algorithm with the traffic estimation data, we might be able to do both better. And both better is, again, good because if you're trying to figure out how many cars you're going to need to divert from this, this queue so that you can get it to actually dissipate faster, both good for operational and safety pieces, you, you need good, accurate information about what's happening uh, in this post-incident traffic environment. Okay, so we pose this as what's called a hybrid state estimation problem. The notation here, x n minus 1, is a vector of the traffic state. Think about density in every 200 meter increment along the roadway. And f is a model that tells us how the traffic state from 30 seconds ago should influence the traffic state now. And it's going to be parameterized by some variable gamma, and gamma is just going to encode where the incidents are located on the roadway and how severe they are. And of course, the model is imperfect, so it's subject to some modeling error. And we have another equation that tells us, based on the sensor readings we see, how those relate to the state variable. You may measure speed, but want to know density. You may measure density, but only have measurements on a subset of the elements of your state vector. Okay? And again, those measurements have errors in them as well, so you see a measurement error term. And the general hybrid state estimation problem is to estimate Given your measurements z1 to zn, all the data you've seen so far, tell me what the traffic state is and tell me what the incident state is. And this can be solved using classical filtering techniques like a multiple model particle filter, which I'll kind of give some hints as to what that looks like. Okay, so the, the key idea is that we're going to both combine a model of traffic flow, which is imperfect, with measurements from the traffic environment, which are incomplete and also prone to error. We're going to combine these two pieces of information together in a way that hopefully gives us better information than what the data alone could give us or than what the model alone could give us. 
And so the model that we use is a very classical mass conservation model called the LWRPDE or the, mass, uh, or the cell transmission model. To get some inter interpretation on the equation, take your roadway, block it into cells. Row IN is how many cars are in this cell at time N. If I want to know how many there are at time N plus 1, well, it's going to depend on how many were there previously plus how many are coming in, how many cars come in across the cell boundary over a time interval as a function of how many cars are up here and how many cars are here. We'll get into more detail in a moment. Plus, I need to subtract off any cars that left this cell over that same time interval. So it's just like keeping count of how many people are in the room. Look at how many people are here now. Check the doors, see if anybody's coming in or going out. That's going to tell you how many people are in the room in the next time step. That's the basic model. The way that you count these flows across the boundaries, you need to use some notion of a, it's called a good enough flux if you're a numerical scientist. The cell transmission model gave these very nice, clean interpretation in terms of sending and receiving functions. You take your fundamental diagram in traffic flow that relates the density of traffic to how many vehicles per hour you can push through the roadway. And directly, you can build the sending function, which says at very light densities, you will see potentially very low flow across this boundary because you don't have any cars to actually go across the boundary. You're sending limited. There are not, doesn't matter what's happening downstream. You just have two cars, so don't expect more than two cars to cross that boundary. Well, if, if you've got plenty of cars to send, you still might not have any place to put them. So the receiving function, also built off the fundamental diagram, checks how, many, how much free space is in the downstream cell. You may have plenty of cars to send, but if there's no place to put them, you'll still see no flow because they can't advance to the next cell. This is the basic intuition behind the mass conservation model that we're going to use as the predictor of what the traffic dynamics look like on the network. So this becomes your model. It doesn't have any explicit parameters in it for incidence, so you just see a model that takes the state at xn minus 1 and gives you the state at xn. It, literally, all these are variables that defined at the previous time step, and here's the density at the next time step. So our idea was basically to take this model and parameterize it so that when there's an accident, if one lane gets blocked, you're going to have a lower maximum speed limit, and you're going to have lower capacity and a smaller jam density. The jam density depends on how many vehicles per mile per lane. So if you lose a lane, you're going to lose uh, maximum storage capacity. And similarly, if two lanes get blocked, well, then again, the throughput will be reduced even further, and so will the storage on the link. OK, so we can parameterize each one of these cells with a different fundamental diagram depending on how many accidents or how severe the accident is in that, in that area. That changes these dynamics because these flow functions now depend on gamma, and it changes this model because it also depends on the location and severity of the incidents. And since we have a new state variable, we have to define how it evolves. The high-level idea here is to use some kind of probabilistic model, in fact, the Markov model, that basically says, if at time n I have no incidents on any cell in my roadway, what's the probability I'm going to see an incident that blocks two lanes in cell 3? That's going to be a transition probability that I can model and specify. Or if there were no incidents at the previous time step, what's the chance that there's going to be a one-lane incident in the first cell? You have to specify all these incident parameters. And, and basically, the high-level idea is that if you have no incidents, you're very unlikely to see incidents in the, f in the next time step. If you've got an incident currently, you should be very likely to still see that incident in the next time step. So the time steps are on the order of like 30 seconds or so, and incidents last typically longer than that. So you specify the model. And then the filtering idea is, is based on a Monte Carlo approach. Uh, basically, the idea is that we're going to take a sample of all the possible uh, realizations of our state space, or at least a sample of the probability distribution that defines the traffic density and the locations of possible incidents with literal you know, samples from that distribution. For each sample, we'll look and see what the probability, if it has no incident, what's the probability we'll see an incident at the next time step. That's defined by this transition matrix that, that, uh, that we have to specify. Once we know which gamma is to simulate, again, these are all based on probabilities, most of the particles are going to go to a no-incident state. Okay? But a few particles, because there's always some non-zero probability of seeing an incident in cell 1 with severity 1 or an incident in cell 2 with severity 2, we'll send a couple particles there as well, defined by this transition probability. And if, when we get the measurements z, it, the measurements are more likely, given the, the, uh, this incident scenario, what we're going to do is believe that it's more likely an incident has occurred. So all these non-incident particles, they don't match very well with the data. This one incident particle matches more closely with the data, so we're going to put more belief that there's actually an incident in this cell. And 
eventually at the next step you basically have to do some resampling to make more particles that look like this one and maybe make fewer particles that look like the non-incident scenario since, there are, since we don't believe that that's actually true. We want to sample more from the state space we think is actually occurring. And then from that resampling step you feed it back into the transition probability matrix to find out if and where incidents might be located at the next time step. So, you, so that's the general idea of the particle filter applied to, to this incident detection problem. Some things that this incident detection algorithm will not solve that no incident detection algorithm can solve is just based on the physics of traffic. So the first thing is that if you have an accident on the roadway or an incident, it takes time for the information about this incident to propagate to upstream sensors or to downstream sensors. So if you have a reduction in throughput, you have to wait for the congestion to build to hit one of your sensors before you can see it. Otherwise, in real time, if you're just looking at the sensor here and the sensor here, and they're two miles away from the incident, the incident has occurred, but your sensors can't see it yet because the phenomena in traffic, the congestion, hasn't touched that sensor yet. That's not a property of my algorithm or anybody else's. That's just an unfortunate fact about trying to measure incidents with fixed location sensors. Another problem is these are not unique uh, solutions. If I have very, very light traffic and I'm just measuring flows upstream and downstream, if the incident is small and only blocks one lane and all of the vehicles can go around it without generating any congestion that back propagates, there's no hope of me measuring it just by looking at inflows and outflows because the congestion won't grow to that point. So these are problems in the results I'll show. If you're trying to do incident detection on low flow regimes, this is hard for every incident detection problem or algorithm that's using only flows. Travel times and speed measurements might give you additional information that, that could help. Okay, so we tested the algorithm first in, in micro simulation. So we, we run a micro simulator that looks, we build the road, discretize it into some cells, time on the, on the y axis, and you can see the heavy congestion that's generated in this plot, the red areas, uh, that's caused by one of the lanes being blocked on the roadway. It goes from a three lane roadway to a two lane roadway. We put inductive loop detectors upstream and downstream, and then we also add in a small subset of GPS vehicles that are equipped that can give us the speeds in different cells. Um, and then here's an example of what the simulation looks like. In the bottom two plots, this is the same traffic. You see each of the individual vehicles simulated from the traffic micro simulator. They're color coded based on the speed. You can see the upstream and downstream loop detector. Here is an estimate from our multiple model particle filter in terms of where the incidents are located and how severe they are. So right now you see the true state as measured by CoreSim and the estimated state using our traffic flow model with incident detection they both agree with each other. In the traffic state, the density is relatively light. And so the true state is, the, again, the red curve. Our estimate is the blue plus minus some standard deviation. On the right, we implemented a particle filter, state-of-the-art estimation algorithm, on a traffic flow model. The only difference between these two estimates is that this model doesn't have information with respect to the incidents. It doesn't have those <laughs> fundamental diagrams that are lower throughput because of those incidents. And in this plot, we implemented the California algorithm, which is a classical incident detection algorithm that has some decision logic that looks for changes in the flows, changes in the densities between two sensors, and then says, OK, I see an incident. An incident has occurred. You can see some congestion already occurring immediately from lane changing, kind of propagates to the other lanes. Um, the algorithm that we, that, that we implemented immediately identifies the location and the severity, partially because it's got that GPS data. It hasn't triggered back to the loop yet. The density estimate is imperfect, but a, a decent fit for what, the incident, uh, for what the traffic state is. The particle filter, on the other hand, has no knowledge of this incident. So every time step, it's making a prediction with the wrong model. So it takes much longer to track the state. In the California algorithm, even though the incident has tracked back to this loop detector, still hasn't yet triggered an incident because it first had to wait for the traffic congestion to backpropagate, and then had to wait further to make sure it's just not an anomaly in the data to, before it'll trigger the alarm to, to push an incident there. So this is in simulation. Again, it's not, uh, it didn't simulate all possible scenarios that could happen, but it gives you at least insight that potentially combining these two algorithms together could improve the performance of both the traffic state estimation and your ability to detect the incidents. What we're doing now is linking this to a project that I did at UC Berkeley several years ago where we did a bunch of vehicles driving up and down a segment of freeway in California, each equipped with GPS vehicles, 100 people driving up and down the stretch of roadway. And what we're doing there now is actually combining this GPS data and the inductive loops to try to detect the incident which occurred during that experiment. There was a major incident in the morning that creates uh, extra congestion here in this red area low speed area, same plot. This is a speed versus a density plot here. And we've implemented the same framework. 
and we can identify uh, lane blockage occurring at the same time the California Highway Patrol reported an incident occurred. We don't have the ground truth in terms of how many lanes were blocked. We also don't have the ground truth in terms of the densities and speeds. But again, it still gives potential that linking these two ideas together, not just in simulation, but also in practice, might lead to better incident detection and traffic estimation. OK, so there's an example from the original experiment. We almost got in trouble during this project because our, the filter that we ran at the time started showing traffic being very congested. And nobody else saw it and assumed that if nobody else sees it, then we must be wrong. So this is actually somebody from traffic.com calling their uh, command center to verify that there's, in fact, traffic uh, in this early morning where it should have been free flowing. OK, so, so that's some of the work that we've been doing on incident detection and traffic estimation together. The last piece I want to talk about is some of the, the latest work that we've been doing and trying to understand how cities perform during these disasters. And you'll see some really, I think, startling information about uh, what happens after events, not just what happens during the evacuation. So the big picture goal is, you know, we want to understand how to make cities smarter and livable and things like this, but we really don't have a good idea of how they perform today, uh, especially with like large scale information about how the transportation network is running. And if you look in the literature, you'll see you know, hundreds of papers about how to quantify the resilience of a, of a transportation system. And while those are you know, useful exercises, what we're really focused on is what can you measure? Give me one performance measure you can actually measure and track. Um, that might be much more insightful than a bunch of them that in principle we'd like to measure, but we actually don't have the data to do. So the high level idea, I want something like the ASCE report card. You know, Bridges got rated a D last year. or you know, the, the water network got rated a C. I don't know precisely the ratings, right? But what can you say about how well traffic is performing in, uh, in Minnesota yesterday? So you already have some companies that produce these annual mobility reports or the TomTom -tom congestion index or things like this. But we wanted on the level of like hour by hour, how bad was that incident? Did it have cascading congestion that propagated through the network or was it localized to just a small area? So, so the idea is to get some basic quantification measure that can tell us how long it takes the system to recover from, from the typical conditions uh, and how bad the deviation from typical was. And this sort of necessarily means we have to quantify what typical traffic looks like on the network. We have to do this very quickly because these are large networks and there's a huge amount of data coming into them. So any algorithm that can work slower than real time isn't going to really help us take actionable information in real time based on this data. So the data that we got access to, we initially went and took our, the Traffic Turk application and did counts at several intersections to look at what the flows look like. And we tried to scale it up and say, good, we have good information at a few intersections. What can we say about what happened in the rest of the city? The rest of the city, after knocking on a lot of doors, we got access to a traffic data set that has just about 700 million taxi trips in New York City. This quote's from Deborah Estrin. She's a, a National Academy of Engineering member in Sensor Network. She says, you know, go to war with the sensors you have, not the ones you want. That's the same philosophy here. This data has the start of the trip and the end of the trip GPS coordinates, the meter distance, and the travel time. But we have no idea about where that travel time was occurring on the network. We don't have the path information that the taxi took. We get no intermediate waypoints of the data. So good. I know the travel time from here to the back of the room, but I don't know if you walked back and forth every row, or if you walked outside and ran around the building, or if you took shortest path. That's the basic problem with the data. So it's not what we desire, but it's what we've got. And you also have it too. We published all this data on my website. So if you want access to large scale taxi data sets, there's hundreds of millions of trips for you to answer whatever questions might be burning in your mind, including things like uh, on the fare side, we haven't touched this, but you have all the information about the, how much it costs to get to different regions of the city as a function of time of day. OK, so we take the road network in New York City. And um, here you're just seeing all of the intersection nodes uh, in the city. And what we're trying to do is actually group these into different regions. So we're going to try to build a matrix of origins and destinations. So we can look at traffic that goes from the black region to the pink region, the pink region to the black region, the black region to the blue region, and so on. And we're going to look at the traffic conditions between those regions. So to define these regions, what we actually ran was an open source algorithm uh, out of uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. It's called the Karlsruhe Fast Flow Partitioner. It's a very sophisticated but open source and accurate way to partition large scale road networks that give you sort of these basic features you'd like, which is that Manhattan here is in a different cluster than uh, regions east of the Hudson River. Right? So it actually gives you good performance on road network graphs. So we have these, this matrix of all the origin destinations. Since our taxi trip comes with starts and end coordinates, we can say out of all the taxi trips that started in this region and went there, 
Well, how long did it take them? And you just have to be a little bit careful because how long is not the right question to ask. The travel time depends also on the distance of your trip. So what we need to do is normalize those travel times by the distance you, you traveled. And okay, in transportation, we call that the pace. It's how many, uh, how many uh, minutes does it take you to drive a mile? Let's say it's the inverse of the speed or the pace. And if you're a runner, you use this all the time, right? Marathon runners, it doesn't matter if you're on a 10 mile run or a 30 mile run, the pace is what you're gonna report, right? As whether you've got a fast pace or a slow pace. So we take the pace of all the trips. This is an example from trips that start and end in midtown Manhattan. And you see a uh, over the course of the week, the typical patterns. You have low, tr you know, fast traffic at night. You have congested traffic during the day. And over the four years, this is hour by hour, over the four years, you have a couple hundred realizations of traffic on a typical Wednesday at 6 a.m. You can also look at the spread of, uh, of those realizations. So you know not only what the average traffic looks like, but how much variability there is. And not surprising, you see high variability during the congested parts of the day. So we should expect when we look at traffic, if, it's, uh, if we're trying to decide what's far from normal, what's far from normal here will be a larger change in pace than how far from here because there's just so much more spread in the data here, which we'd like to encounter when, when we're trying to define distances. Okay, so once we have the hour by hour traffic conditions, for a given hour, we'll look at all 200 something realizations uh, we have of the network of these origin destination paces we want to find out um, a, a low dimensional representation of this data, and we also want to find which data is actually not part of that low dimensional space. In other words, you have this chicken and egg problem when you're trying to find out what's far from normal, because if you, if you compute the mean using data that has outliers in it, of course those outliers shift your notion of the mean, which can then make it very hard to uh, get confused between what are truly outliers and what you actually considered not an outlier because it was skewed because you calculated the mean with that outlier in the data set. So the way that we get around it is using an idea in, in, uh, in matrix completion. The high level idea is we're gonna build a data matrix M. So the matrix M basically is gonna have a vector of all the origin destination paces at one hour. And then we're gonna look at the, a week ago, that same origin destination pace vector, that'll be the next column. Two weeks ago, another origin destination vector from three weeks ago and so on until you complete the matrix. And we want to basically say, I want a new construction of this matrix M that is a composition of two other matrices, L and C, added together. And L is a matrix that's low rank. It basically would be the same thing as if you applied principal component analysis and threw away some of the, the higher, uh, some of the lower uh, principal components. And C is a matrix that's sparse and only contains outliers. So C in particular, we're talking about column sparse. So if a particular day doesn't look like the rest, we'd like to throw that into the C matrix and not into the L matrix so that the L stays low rank and the C matrix is mostly zeros but has a few of these outliers kept in it. So this is a fancy way of basically saying L, needs to, L plus C, the low rank matrix plus the column sparse matrix, should look like your original data matrix subject to small errors and some appropriate norm. And we're gonna minimize L and C L we want to be minimized in a way that makes it low rank. That's the Frobenius norm is the correct mathematical way to treat that. And is column sparse. Most of the columns are gonna be filled with zeros. This can be achieved with an L12 norm. Basically penalizes having too much mass in any of the columns. Okay, so this is not our idea, but an algorithm that was open sourced and so we were able to leverage it and apply it to our data set. Because this optimization algorithm is convex, it can work for very large data sets. We apply it to our data set it allows us to figure out sort of the anomalies and then how, measure how far apart the traffic is. The plots here you're gonna see on the left panel is three weeks before, during, and after Hurricane Sandy. The right is three weeks before, during, and after a typical week in New York City. Each of the points that you see is color-coded based on the pace of the starting point of the trip. I can't show you the full path, but the blue is the fast trips, the red is the slow trips, and you see every day New York City gets congested. I don't know where the trips are going here, but. And at night, you see few trips, but they're, they're relatively fast moving. And this is true in both panes. You're just looking at typical traffic, and you can see these sort of measures of how anomalous the traffic are are very similar. The green being Hurricane Sandy, and the, and the red being a measure of atypicalness of, of the pane on the right. So now we're approaching Hurricane Sandy, which hits on Monday night. You see this mayor evacuate parts of the system. You see the bus system shut down. MTA shuts down. The traffic starts to get unusual, unusual light. You would see heavier traffic in New York City on a typical Monday morning. The tunnels close, Sandy hits land, major flooding, power is going out all over the place. You have almost no taxi trips, but those that are there are unusually fast, right? And the next day the weather improves, you start to see 
uh, traffic respond. There's a lot of trips, but it's relatively light traffic in New York City. And that's until Wednesday when the airport reopens, systems resume, and you have everybody trying to get back into the city and they generate catastrophic gridlock traffic throughout the city. Right? And so you can see the worst and most extreme traffic during the event happened not during the evacuation period. It happened during trying to get people back into the city. And it will take about five days before the traffic conditions return to typical conditions as far as the origin destination paces are concerned, um, even though things are still, you know, still parts of the system have no power, things like this. So, um, so the video continues to play, but I want to just kind of show you another plot. These are all the simplified grid, lower Manhattan, midtown, upper Manhattan. We look at the paces between these regions for interpretation. You can see things like lower Manhattan throughout that period stays unusually fast, and that's due to the fact that lower Manhattan has no power. And you see on Wednesday, when everybody's trying to get back into the city, you see this huge red area on almost every trip to any other trip, which was caused by basically everybody trying to get back in. Now, New York City does a fantastic job with their events in terms of evacuations, but we're trying to figure out, well, what about reentry process? So what our tool does, because we have so much data, we can also compare things like, well, Sandy happened a year after Hurricane Irene. What do the traffic conditions look like from one of those events to the other? Or what about the snowpocalypse? You have all these events that happen. Of course, I don't want to manually label them. I want the algorithm, and it does, tell us which moments in time are outliers, and then a bunch of outliers consecutively tells us an event is happening. And then we can compare those things. When we compare them, you can see that the worst events in New York City in terms of duration are things weather-related. Hurricane Sandy, snowpocalypse, another blizzard, Hurricane Irene, more blizzard, New Year's Eve, the first cultural event that causes uh, traffic that's anomalous enough for it to be uh, in the t basically the top 10 here. And we can look at how long it is. We can look at how, much, how many minutes per mile it adds to the average trip happening in New York City uh, taxi network. We can also find out which parts of the network are the hardest to get across during these events. And it really helps us understand better you know, what the city is responding in response to these events. So the long-term goal, you know, New York City is very progressive. Know your zone. When there's a hurricane, if you live in this neighborhood, I want you to know when I say zone A, you don't have to move or you need to move. And that's very important because when these events happen, you know, if you can't evacuate, you might lose lives. Right? You've got to get people out of harm's way. But the problem that we're trying to point out is that it's also important bringing people back into the city. If you're a first responder and you're trying to restore power or trying to get food and water to people who were not able to evacuate and needed to shelter in place, the worst possible thing you can do is let everybody come in unrestricted and congest your network so that you can't actually get the emergency services to the people who need them most. So while most of the, the literature so far has been very focused on emergency ev evacuation, again, it makes sense, we're trying to raise awareness that there's another problem, which is the, um, the post-emergency reentry process. And traffic control might actually play a good role there to help mitigate some of these catastrophic events that we saw in the case of Hurricane Sandy. So just a brief summary, I tried to give you an overview of some of the hard traffic estimation problems. And unfortunately, these hard problems are also the ones that are safety critical. And we saw examples in the pre-planned events where we use temporary sensor networks to help collect information to better manage those events. We saw sort of the, the classic stuff that we regularly focus on in transportation engineering, which is detecting incidents and providing traffic information. We saw that linking these two types of problems together can actually help you do better than solving those two problems independently. And then more recently, we talked about how a measure, not the only one, and certainly not a comprehensive measure, of how to quantify how cities perform during events so that we might ultimately help city planners and emergency personnel address both the evacuation and reentry process into cities. So with that, I'd be very happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have about eight minutes for questions. So uh, again, we have to use the uh, microphone. So let me just walk over here. Yeah, Dan, this is uh, really interesting stuff. I wanted to ask if you'd maybe give it some thought to not only detecting incidents, but maybe even predicting when they're likely to occur. Yeah. And that using that as information you could feed back, okay, to travelers or traffic controllers. Yeah, this is a fantastic question, basically. It's great to know when the incidents happen. It's better to know. I think Wayne Gretzky, right, was famous for, you know, the, the great hockey player doesn't skate to where the puck is. They skate to where the puck is going to be. And if you're trying to predict, you know, improve safety on roadways, 
It's one thing to deal with the incidents that have already occurred. The better one is to try to solve the problem of the incidents before they happen. And I would say that from the types of data sets that are readily available today, like GPS in a vehicle, I think this is a very hard problem to solve. Um, because you don't yet have good information about what's happening to the vehicles around you. I think if you look ahead a few years and look at connected vehicles, you look at vehicles that have LIDAR or adaptive cruise control, they're going to start to give you information not about just your vehicle alone, but also other vehicles. You can look at accelerations and decelerations, the distance between other vehicles. So you'll have better context for what the vehicle is actually doing. I know here at Minnesota there's even good work being done to put lots of sensors in an area where there are accidents so you can actually measure near misses and lane changes and things like this. Um, I think it's definitely coming. I think it's the right way to look at the problem. I, I don't yet see you know, national scale data sets that, that would really help do this type of stuff in real time. If it can be provided, absolutely that would be something you'd want to feed back into to your tools, both in the detection side and also in the prevention side. Hi, Dan. I have a related question uh, uh, that, so in, in your particle filter model, the transition metrics that you mentioned about, is that state dependent? Like, it, does it depend on the density? Yeah, a, a good question. So that, that matrix, yeah. the transition that basically says, given that there's no incident now, is there an incident here or there and what severity? That actually is a model that's extremely difficult to build because you would necessarily need lots of data that tells you when you don't see incidents, how quickly they transition to incidents. And not just in one place, but across your network. And what we showed in, in this work was that basically you don't have to have ultra-precise models of those transition probabilities. So even though we don't consider them as density dependent, which they certainly would be when the density is increasing or you have high variance in the speed, certainly you're going to be more prone to seeing an incident than if you've got light traffic and all homogeneous speeds. Um, we don't include that information, and that necessarily makes our model have higher error, which means that we have to have a little bit higher data rates come in to help sort out what the truth is, given that the model is less perfect than we'd like it to be. If you have additional information that can make that model more accurate, it will only improve the performance of the algorithm, and, and state-dependent transitions would be even, even more accurate. Excellent question. Any other questions? Any off an internet land? Uh, given that uh, we have a tight deadline uh, and uh, uh, we need to get uh, our speaker over to the LRT station so we can make a flight, uh, uh, just let join, help me uh, thank our speaker. Uh, uh, thank you. A very interesting talk and very uh, useful. I just want to remind you all that next week, same time, same place, uh, we will have a talk on low-cost centimeter accurate mobile positioning. Uh, Todd Humphreys uh, from uh, University of Texas at Austin will be here and speaking at that time, basically talking about future designs of smartphones, which will have much higher accuracies for positioning. And uh, Certainly. our yeah. speaker today, uh, Dan, said, that's awesome because he knows Todd Humphreys and said, boy, he's the top number one uh, expert on GPS in the country. And we're going to have him here next week, same time, same place. So I assume all of you will be back here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank and you. Thank you, Dan.